Welcome to another episode of The Brand Called You, a podcast and podcast show that brings you leadership lessons, knowledge, experience, and wisdom from thousands of amazing individuals from around the world. I'm your host, Ashutosh Garg, and today I'm delighted to welcome a very, very accomplished author and coach from Frankfurt, Germany, Catherine Van Oud Houston. Catherine, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me. Catherine is a coach and she's an author. She's an author of a book titled Selfless Leadership. So Catherine, let's first start talking about your book. Uh, Tell me a little bit about your book. Well, I decided to to write the book as a reflection of my coaching process. Mm -hmm. So it's actually a self-coaching book. It has the exact same content, the steps, and the most importantly, the practices Mm -hmm. for learning how to discover the servant or selfless leader within. Okay. And what uh, makes a selfless leader or before that, what, how how do you define a selfless leader? Mm. So for me, the the biggest actually impediment to great leadership is the ego. Mm -hmm. It's actually the idea of being a separate self Mm. and that this self has to become better. So much of the servant leadership literature and Mm. the interest in servant leadership is becoming about uh, about becoming a better ego, Mm -hmm. a better person. Mm. But um, what I found is that actually the way to become a truly, really um, uh, uh, good leader, great leader, is to become selfless, to see Mm -hmm. the core selflessness um, Mm. of who we are. Mm. And um, so for me, selfless leadership is literally a leader leadership by someone who has seen through the ego. Okay. Very interesting. And then it's a very difficult thing to give up one's ego, isn't it? Yes. um, You could also say it's impossible. It's actually impossible to give up, but it's possible to see through it, to see Mm. that it is a construct Mm. that we were, um, that we have learned from a very, very, from being a very, very small child. We were conditioned to think of ourselves as a separate self. And then all that time we've been building up our ego. Mm. You know, you so well said. I remember when I was, uh, when I had founded India's second largest chain of pharmacies, I used to tell all my young uh, colleagues, when I used to speak to them, I said, one of the first rules of retail is to take off your ego every morning and hang it on the hook behind your bathroom door and then come to work because there's no place in retail for your ego. Yes, yes. Usually when we say things like that, we mean the... um the overconfidence, right? And the arrogance and the pride. Right. Um, but actually, I mean something even more radical. So mm-hmm. I mean, actually seeing through the, the whole concept of being a separate self. Okay. And this is truly, it's non-duality. So it um, has a rich uh, tradition in India. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is really about seeing that uh, we don't have to be anyone. We don't have to construct this identity and right. try to be for the personal self mm-hmm. because it simply doesn't exist. Well said. Well said. And uh, you know, when I was reading about you, we were. I was also reading about evaluation of a selfless leader. How do you evaluate a selfless leader? Yes. Yeah, so for me, there are um, there are a couple of insights that we can see, um, and uh, we can evaluate um, how far we are. Um, this is all language. How far we are on this path mm-hmm. um, by how much of these insights we've seen. Okay. So um, there are four of them. Mm-hmm. And the first one is that we are actually not the doer, not mm-hmm. the decider and controller of our life, mm-hmm. but we are being lived. So um, this is the first insight and it allows us to really let go instead mm-hmm. of, you know, managing everything. Oh, I have to do this training. I have to become this person. I have to become better at that. We can relax and understand that we are also being lived. Mm. By life. Well said. And could you, for our viewers and listeners, give me an example of uh, this? Yeah, so many people um, believe that they have to um, uh, plan their day, think their thoughts, you know, manage their really how they show up in life. Mm-hmm. But if you look at your direct experience, you can see, for example, that you don't create your thoughts. Mm. If you look at your right now, what you're thinking as you're listening to this. Mm. It just appears Correct. in your experience. Mm. And so by looking at, by practicing uh, particular exercises, mm. you can come to see directly that it is your experience that you mm. are being lived. Very interesting. And uh, my next question to you, Catherine, is uh, how does coaching assist and support a selfless leader on their journey? 
Mm. So I have a very particular type of coaching, which is helping people to see these insights. Mm -hmm. So I work with a very particular process and these self-inquiry practices. Mm -hmm. And self-inquiry practices are kind of guided con contemplation, meditation, where you, just as I explained about looking at where your thoughts come from, you look at your daily life and work and come to see things for yourself. Mm -hmm. So this is a type of co coaching that you could say it's quite structured. Um, and it's, uh, but it helps you to see things that um, you have to see for yourself and not just believe because somebody tells you to believe them. Interesting. The other term that is often used is servant leader. Yes. You know, a lot of people use the term servant leader. I'm not sure how many people actually understand what a servant leader means, but I'd love to get your perspective on servant leadership and uh, how can servant leadership be evaluated? Mm. So um, I've purposely started using the term selfless leader instead of servant leader, because um, the way I understand servant leadership is that our true nature, what we really are as human beings, is to be selfless, is selfless mm. and in service to others. Mm. So I'm not talking about some new style of leadership. Mm -hmm. Servant leadership is often proposed as a style where you put others first. So it's a kind of moral imperative, the next mm -hmm. level of being a good person mm -hmm. as a leader. But mm -hmm. I see it differently. I see selfless service, um, seva, uh, to be our true nature. Mm -hmm. So it's a process of uncovering what we believe, mm -hmm. you know, what, the illusions that what we think we are and seeing what we really are. And when we see this, our selflessness, then we are naturally in service. So for mm -hmm. me, that is the true servant leadership. It's not something you become. Mm -hmm. It's something you discover you already are. You know, you use two very interesting terms in the last few minutes. One was non-duality and the other is seva. Yes. Uh, what Have you had some kind of an exposure or have you had an impact from some of the Hindu scriptures? Not, uh, not particularly Hindu, but modern non-duality, yes. Um, that is also the, the philosophy behind my um, approach mm -hmm. to leadership. So I, I try to bridge non-dual philosophy and insights with the world of business and leadership, because I believe that is what we desperately need. We need mm -hmm. less egos and more non-dual understanding in the business world. Very well said. And one more question for your book uh, before I move to your role as a coach. Is, is your book available on Amazon and other platforms? Yes, it's um, available as an ebook and in paperback in all uh, Amazon stores. Unfortunately, in India, it's not available as a paperback. I don't know why. Mm -hmm. Amazon can't answer why, but it's okay. at, at least as an ebook, it's available. Fair enough. Thank you. So, Catherine, now let's talk uh, about uh, your coaching and mentoring journey. Yes. Uh, let me start by asking you what made you become a coach? Ah. Um, I did my first coaching training back in 2006. Mm -hmm. So it was almost immediately after studying law and, and starting in the world of, of healthcare, um, normal, you know, change management, project management roles, but I also wanted to coach. And the real motivation was that I wanted to help and serve others. Mm. So this was from, from the very beginning of my career. I wanted okay. to improve, <laughs> you know, myself, other people, the way mm -hmm. we work together. This was always the motivation. Fantastic. So one of the questions that I've asked a lot of coaches is that, you know, uh, when I was growing up uh, in the corporate world four decades ago, coaching was something that was either done by a family elder mm. or by someone senior in the company who took a liking for you. What has changed over the years that people are now willing to pay for coaching and it has become such a formal profession? Mm. I think um, it's become more and more clear that work is about dealing with people. Mm -hmm. So it's it's no longer, no matter what job you have, it's a people job. Mm. And for that, you have to understand relating. You have to understand human beings and you have to understand yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think that is one reason because a coach really helps you deal with the people issues, your mm -hmm. own internal issues Correct. and with other people, the relationship issues. And this has become a crucial um, factor in success at mm. work. And in your opinion, what's the difference between coaching and mentoring? So actually, what I um, what I do, you could say it's a mix of mentoring, coaching, and um, 
giving advice <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> because it's this very specific um, path that I follow. Yeah. But um, if we look at what now people call coaching, um, I would say this is more the helping a person self-reflect. Mm -hmm. And mentoring, there is for me more of an um, element of guidance of mm -hmm. this is what I've learned. This is some advice. So there's more of an element of, of knowledge um, being passed on. Mm -hmm. uh, you also mentioned that you have developed your own unique process of coaching. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Would you be able to share some of these uh, processes or thoughts with, the, with us? Yeah, so this is actually this framework for, for selfless leadership that I coach uh, with. And um, I already explained the first, the first insight, right, of, of four, which is that uh, we're not the doer. Mm -hmm. um, and the second one is that we are actually not the limited ego. So we're not these beliefs about ourselves, but we are um, new in every moment. We are free. Mm. And then the third one, which is very important, I think, in, in business um, and leadership, is that we are not separate from each other as human beings, but mm. that we are connected. Okay. So there's always permanent connection between everyone and everything going on. Mm. And if you see these insights, it leads to the fourth one, which is that we are naturally in service to okay. others. Mm. And this is the, the specific framework that I coach through, and I use specific practices to help coaches see this. Wow, amazing. Uh, my next question is that, you know, that we've of, we often say uh, that, you know, we should all have a coach. The question that is often asked from me is that how does a coach evaluate whether mm -hmm. they have a good coach? What is your yes. thought? I think that's that's highly specific depending mm -hmm. on, on the type of coaching uh, you're looking for. Mm -hmm. um, for me, at least, it's become clear that um, your your coach needs to be able to explain mm -hmm. um, in in very clear language. Mm -hmm. um, you could say what your problem is, <laughs> mm -hmm. or what the issue is. So the ability to talk about these things, to make distinctions using language and concepts, mm -hmm. and in the talking about it, new realizations come up. Mm -hmm. So if you find, for example, you know, a coach who only talks in platitudes mm. or abstractions mm. or there's, it's not clear what exactly, it's not helping you um, mm. get these concepts clear in your mind. Mm. Uh, that's definitely an example of a not a good coach. <laughs> okay. okay. In my opinion. Okay. And uh, in your opinion, how long should a coaching relationship be for? Uh, again, that's, that's highly uh, individual depending mm -hmm. on the type of issue. So actually for the type of coaching I do, which is helping you to this direct seeing of this mm -hmm. understanding, it can be quite short mm -hmm. um, because it's, it's using a very specific method. Mm. Um, if it's more about um, helping you, for example, find self-confidence in your role or whatever, mm. it's highly individual. For some people, that's three weeks and mm -hmm. it's done. For others, it's, it's a three-year trajectory. So I think it's more about um, being very clear what you want as a coachee, what it is that you're trying to achieve with a coach, mm -hmm. and then you can determine, you will have more of an idea of how long that will take. Amazing. Uh, my next question to you, Catherine, is how does culture impact coaching? Um, Culture is, I would say, in this sense, um, a set of beliefs about how we operate and, and values and, um, I guess, also needs. So mm -hmm. it, um, it affects our culture, our, our um, culture affects our, our um, ways of working. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking at coaching, it is going to affect um, the beliefs that operate in coaching, mm -hmm. how the coach and the coachee work together. So in that sense, co uh, co culture, just as the personality itself, is highly, um, yeah, uh, it highly influences the whole coaching process. But at the same time, I would say that if you, if it, we're talking about the type of coaching, for example, that I do, it is intercultural, cross-cultural, because it's mm. about what it means to be human. Mm. And this is not dependent, you know, it's not dependent on, on your culture. Mm. Um, whether you think you are a self or not, or whether you believe in the ego, this is basic to every single human being on the planet. Mm. And yet uh, ego 
mm-hmm. uh, differs dramatically in different cultures. And one of the things that you work on is, uh, you know, how to manage one's ego. Yes, how do you well, tackle actually, this? Yeah, actually, it's it's seen through the ego, and we have to t- talk about definitions because ego, as I mean it, really here is the the self identity, the concept of yourself. Mm-hmm. And um, this is different per culture, absolutely. But every culture, we are conditioned to to believe that we have a separate self. Correct. And um, seeing through that is not dependent on culture. Mm-hmm. That's just um, the same for everybody, how absolutely. to do that. And, uh, you know, a follow-up question for you is that what is the difference when it comes to uh, managing the ego from a coaching perspective in senior leadership and emerging leadership? Well, the good thing about senior leaders, and that's why I like working very much with senior leaders, is that they've tried all the other stuff. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So they've tried the leadership development. They've tried uh, to become better people in various ways. If they're truly interested in servant leadership, for example, Mm -hmm. they want to do good in the world. They know that this is what really will bring them fulfillment Mm -hmm. because they've tried all the other stuff, you know, the better career, more responsibility, bigger budget, everything. So I really... um, like that um, because when they come to me they're ready to really look at some fundamental things and no longer okay i just need a better job or i need maybe more direct reports a bigger project no they're done with all that they know it really has to be about now an inner shift and some really transformation inside Mm, fascinating so now let me move uh, to a few questions for you on uh, the younger leaders who are now entering the workforce you know the millennials and the gen z's and Several millennial leaders are already getting into leadership roles in their own organizations. Yeah. My first question to you, Catherine, is uh, how are workplaces adapting themselves to uh, welcome these new younger set of leaders who come in with a very different mindset? Mm. Well, from what I observe here in in Germany, um, not enough. Okay. Right, so we, they are, the uh, organizations are sticking to the very much to the traditional hierarchical roles, the traditional mm-hmm. structure, even though what I think is is a um, um, a rule for anything that is going to happen now is that it's all about co-creation and collaboration. Mm-hmm. So, in fact, we should be breaking up all the structures mm-hmm. and allowing people to work together as intensely and creatively as possible. Okay. The problem is that what is in the way of this type of collaboration is exactly the ego, mostly of the senior leaders. Correct. Well said. Well said. And uh, a lot of these young leaders, you know, and I I have a lot of respect for the new thinking that they are bringing into into Mm. humanity. And and I, I generally find that ego is almost missing or... In, in the younger group of people, uh, yet they bring some vulnerabilities. How yes. are organizations handling a lot of the vulnerabilities our young leaders are bringing in? Again, I think we're not there yet. I think we don't really know how to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, and here again, it's something that maybe they don't have the, they have less of the arrogance and the pride and, and, and mm-hmm. the hierarchical thinking that the older generation maybe uh, has. But what they do have is the vulnerability, as you just said, of taking things so personally. Correct. And this is just stereotyping, right? It's of course not everybody is like this, so it doesn't really make sense to talk about groups of people like this. Yeah. But um, there's a lot more of the, yeah, it's all about me, and this is also a, this is just a new type of ego. Mm-hmm. But now it's not the the big prideful arrogant ego. It's the, oh no, I'm I'm so vulnerable. Something's wrong with me. Everything is about me. Mm. So you probably won't be surprised that I say this, but for me, the solution to the, to the younger generation at work is also learning to transcend the ego. Mm, that's it. And being, so it's about collaborating without making this all about me and my issues and my mm. problems. Mm. Okay. Uh, I've got time for one more question and I'm trying to debate what to ask you, but let me ask you a question, which is that, Based on the incredible journey you've had as, as, as a, a selfless leader, as someone who's written so much, as someone who's worked very hard and is supporting people on managing ego, what would you say are three life lessons you would want uh, our viewers and listeners to take away from 
our conversation. Yeah, good one. The first one is it's not about you. Mm -hmm. So don't take, take things so personally. Mm -hmm. And this is really, if you can stop, um, if you can see that things are not about you, mm -hmm. even just a little bit, it starts to give you more freedom. Yeah. Um, the second thing is that um, this uh, is, would be this idea of, the, um, of this personal self, mm -hmm. the limited separate self. This is a story that we have created about ourselves. Most of what we believe ourselves to be is simply not true. Mm -hmm. It's something that we learned. So learning to, to identify these beliefs and to start questioning them mm -hmm. is going to give you multiple more options of dealing with life. Right. Yeah, for example, if you believe, oh, I'm, I'm not good at dealing with people, mm -hmm. you have this strong belief, but you never question it. You're going to limit your opportunities for, for working together with others because you believe this so, so strongly. Mm -hmm. It limits you. Correct. Correct. And so, the third one. Yeah, go ahead, please. <laughs> and I guess the third one would be to really, um, we have only this one life, we think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We're not sure, right? But probably. And to really um, enjoy that we are given this opportunity to experience anything at all. Mm. So you wake up in the morning and the whole of the world appears. And to really try to um, see what a, what a miracle that is, that we get to experience anything at all. Mm. Well said, well said. Uh, Catherine, on that note of uh, we only have one life and it is so true. I mean, Hinduism does, parts of Hinduism don't believe in that, but... Uh, yes. Uh, we do have one one life that we all remember. Uh, that much we can say for certain. Uh, thank you so much for speaking to me. Thank you for talking to me about your book, Selfless Leadership. I will look for the book and I'll ask all my viewers and listeners to also check out the book. Uh, thank you for talking to me about your incredible journey as a coach. And uh, thank you for sharing with me uh, so much about how important it is to manage one's ego. Thank you again Thank and you. good luck. Thank you very much for having me. It was a great conversation. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the brand called You Videocast and Podcast, a platform that brings you knowledge, experience and wisdom of hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. Do visit our website www.tbcy.in to watch and listen to the stories of many more individuals. You can also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. Just search for the brand called You.